I always start off with this picture. The, uh, one of the interesting things is, is that, first off, lightning does strike more than a place more than once. Uh, my tower at the previous house got struck at least once a year. The uh, one repeater that I have gets struck almost every electrical storm. And so knowing how to deal with, with uh, lightning will prevent you from having damage. And uh, it's anyway, anywhere from DC to gamma rays. Uh, one of the things I always want to try to and, uh, tell everybody, and this is in the, uh, the book that Ward Silver uh, wrote, uh, you should always follow your local electrical codes. If none exist, then follow your USA National Electrical Code, or if you're outside of the US, follow whatever your country's electrical code is. And uh, you always want to be safe. Uh, make sure you, what you're doing is electrically safe. Uh, the ARL recommends vacating your, sh your shack during thunderstorms, and that, that's a good idea. Uh, also, I'm going to ask that you hold questions to the end uh, for a couple reasons. One, because of the live stream. Uh, two, for the most part, whatever question you're going to ask, I'm going to probably answer in one or two slides anyway. Uh, and not to mention the fact that I don't hear worth a darn. And uh, on the very last slide, uh, you will find a um, uh, QR code that you can scan, take a picture of scan and you can download the presentation. Okay, so the characteristics is a typical lightning strike is anywhere from three to four pulses per strike, anywhere from 10 microseconds to 170 microseconds. Uh, the first pulse average is anywhere around 18 kiloamps with 98% falling between 3 kiloamps and 140 kiloamps. Uh, subsequent pulses are half the current. Of course, we're in Dayton, and so I sort of target this presentation for the Dayton area. Uh, Dayton has about 50 thunderstorms a year. If you have a 75-foot tower, you're likely to have one strike a year. I had a 50-foot tower, and it took a strike once a year. So I can confirm that the 75-foot tower taking a strike once a year is accurate. And uh, if any, I do any math in here, just to keep things simple, I'll use 10 kiloamps for strike energy and a 10 microseconds at rise time. And uh, I mentioned before, lightning contains uh, DC through gamma rays. The gamma rays were detected by a NASA satellite a few years ago from, uh, set from uh, lightning strikes that they had recorded. So how I learned the hard way was in 1984, I built a new house with the builder being very cooperative. He, poured the, he dug the hole and poured the, the concrete for my tower base. And uh, when the neighbors saw the, the hole for a tower, they came over and they, the first question they asked was, well, are you a ham radio operator? And I thought, oh, oh here it goes. But the, uh, they said, well, that's okay. We, we, if you put up a tower, it's a lightning rod and we won't have to worry about lightning striking our houses anymore. <laughs> and so they went on to tell me that like the house two doors down had a strike through the roof and almost burnt down. One a block away had the chimney blown apart and and, oh, by the way, the trees on your lot get hit almost every storm. So it's like, okay. <laughs> it was high ground. I bought it because it was high ground, you know. And, and so the first seven years, we had strikes every year, and I had damage every year. So I uh, got a hold of the Polyphaser book, which is, is no longer in, being published, but you can find PDF copies of it randomly on the Internet. So I bought that book, read it, implemented their system, and for the other 13 years we lived there, I had zero damage. And so one of the things is, well, what is the cause of the damage? Is it voltage or is it current? Well, it's really both. And with current being the worst, because current can burn through conductors and everything else. So the, one of the things is that the current develops a voltage across the resistance. So if you've got poor resistance connections, uh, or inductance, that develops a significant amount of voltage, which then can cause punch-throughs. And uh, the formula for calculating a, a voltage across an inductor, that's what this bottom formula is. Uh, here's a simple transistor circuit. And the reason why I have this in the presentation is, 
Um, what causes this transistor to fail? Well, if you, what, what causes it to fail is, is if you have too much voltage across any of the two junctions, or any of the three junctions, that punches the transistor and it's gone. So one of the primary things to preventing damage during lightning storms is making sure everything is at the same potential and that you don't have any differences of potential. Now, the, the house that I mentioned before, this is what the, the grounding system looked like. Uh, it's, everything was grounded, but nothing was bonded. And this is the way, you know, if, if you go back into the 80s, power companies and things felt this was the right way to do things. And even though the National Electrical Code said it had to be bonded, a lot of electrical companies said, no, no, you can't do that. So, but the truth of the matter is, is what you really want to do is have something like this, where everything is bonded together. And when everything is bonded together, there is no reason for the current from the lightning strike to go into your house to find another path to ground, because the ground path is, is, is all outside, because everything's at the same potential. And one of the things I feel is one of the most important parts in stopping damage is single point grounds. And uh, you'll notice a few, a lot of these uh, illustrations I've had uh, in the last couple slides in this page are out of Ward Silver's uh, book, Grounding and Bonding from the Amateur Radio Operator. And uh, there, there's a lot of, that, that's very accurate. But anyway, this is, by having everything come in at one point, everything in your house is at the same potential. There's, if there's, everything's at the same potential, there's no current flow, there's no damage. And here's another example of how you can do it. The, the current house I live in, I had to do something like the second slide, where it, or the second image, in that I had to run a, a ground wire from the electrical ground over to the, where the, the cables for the uh, ham antennas come in. And uh, so that's an alternative way of doing it if you can't bring it all in the same place. And a lot of you people have that, that same issue. Resistance can be both a friend and an enemy. And it's an enemy because if you pass current through it, you got a voltage difference. Uh, but on the other hand, it can uh, lower current flow with place in the right place. Uh, in a way, lightning protection just breaks down to plain old, old, old Ohm's law. However, you have to consider impedance, not just resistance, because uh, inductance can increase your voltage. So it's, it's impedance, not just resistance. And uh, for example, a half inch piece of uh, coax, half inch coax, 100 feet long, is about 51 microhenries. Uh, tower legs are somewhere in the five microhenry area per 10 foot. Uh, tower joint resistance is 0 0.001. All of those things lead to having a significant difference in voltage between the top of the tower and the bottom of the tower. Uh, I found some a whole bunch of really good papers on, on grounding. Uh, this, it's in this link. Uh, if you download the PowerPoint presentation, you can click on the link and get to it. Uh, for ground rods, you care about uh, what your soil resistivity is. So here's a comparison of what the uh, different resistances are you will find throughout the world. And uh, there's some, some are really, <laughs> I get really, you get, have to get really excited about someone who's got a 200,000 ohm uh, per centimeter uh, resistance. That's going to be really hard to, to uh, deal with lightning. So as for grounding, typical grounding uh, requirements is the National Electrical Code wants you to be below 25 ohms. Uh, the National uh, the, the IEEE standard 142, it depends. Uh, standard 1100 is 5 ohms. Motorola wants 10 ohms. Uh, Verizon's standard is 5 ohms. And the typical telecom switch is 2 ohms. So if you want to calculate what your resistance is, on this page it's got the formula. And this is based on a single ground rod. And it's out of the military handbook 419. And so if you take a, have a soil ground resistance, 5,000 centimeters per, um, 5,000 ohms per centimeter, resistance to earth is 20.67 ohms for a standard ground rod. If the soil resistance is 2,500 ohms, then you're down to 10.34. 
If your soil resistance, if you're lucky and your soil resistance is down to 100 centimeters, then your resistance to earth is 0.41 ohms. But if you pass 10,000 kiloamps through that 0.41 ohms, you got 4,135 volts across it. So even a small amount of resistance is, it can be hazardous. If you have three ground rods, they're, they've got the 0.14 ohms resistance. You then have 1,378 volts at the top of the ground rod. And it's just the top of the ground rod. So here's some ways you can improve the ground. Uh, you can uh, you get, have multiple ground wires coming off each tower leg, going to multiple ground rods. Um, the last house, I had two ground rods on each tower leg. And so what you do is you've got an eight foot ground rod. You put the first one in, you put one at the tower leg, you put another one in that's eight feet, eight, eight feet times two, 16 feet out. And then if you want another one, you go another 16 feet beyond that. Uh, inductance can sneak in. Uh, these pictures probably don't show up that well. Uh, but the, uh, if, if you look at the, uh, uh, I don't, let's see if I can turn the, turn the uh, laser pointer on. Right, this, this ground, ground wire comes over this way, takes a 90 degree corner, comes down to the concrete, takes a 90 degree corner, and then over to the ground rod. Well, each of those really nice looking 90 degree angles are a significant amount of inductance. You don't want to do that. You want nice, slow curves on ground wires. Any kind of 90 degree turns to make it look neat, you're adding inductance and you're increasing the voltage involved. Just don't do that. Uh, but like, like I said, it's, it's good for DC, but it's not good for uh, RF, anything above 100 kilohertz. And in this case, the inductance on a 90 degree bend is 0.15 microhenries. Six inductors in this particular tower leg makes a total of 0.9 microhenries. And using the formula I mentioned before, the 10,000 amps in 10 microseconds, you've got 900,000 volts at the bottom of that tower across that ground wire. Uh, here's just another uh, uh, method of grounding a tower. Uh, what gauge for the ground wire? Um, I sort of thought it was nuts, but uh, NEC recommends at, at least 10 gauge, but for antennas, 14 gauge. Polyphaser recommends the use of uh, 10 gauge. Uh, Lord Silver uh, recommends six gauge or two gauge. Uh, Moldor recommends six gauge. Uh, Mike Holt says six gauge. My power company uses six gauge. I currently use four gauge. Uh, but you also have to consider skin inductance, um, skin effect inductance, and resistance. Uh, Al, Al Torres, KP4AQI and SK, likes to use take old power cables, old Roma cables. He takes the three wires out of it, twists them, and uses that for a ground wire. And one of the reasons why it's not really a, the 14 gauge isn't that bad, if I come across here at 14 gauge, it can take, it can handle one strike at 187 kiloamps, which if you happen to have multiple strikes, it might be a problem, but it will handle one strike and survive. So that's why you can go by with 14 gauge. Uh, always use coax protectors. Uh, for VHF and up, I use quarter wave shorting stubs. Uh, the advantage of quarter wave shorting stubs is they can take strikes all day long and they'll never fail. But you can only use them if you're talking about a single frequency, single band, and they're, they're too darn big for build for HF. Uh, guy wires need to be grounded. Uh, here are some more examples of uh, bonding options. And one of the questions I, I get is, does it work? Yeah, it does. Here's, I don't know how well this shows up, but you can see the, the black on the transformer right there. 
And uh, there's uh, the, it's not the greatest, but over here you can, this is the connection to the grid just hanging off in midair. That was a direct strike to that transformer, blew it off the grid. I had zero damage inside the house. Uh, the house is basically to the uh, right of that transformer and about 20 feet lower uh, in height. And so, I mean, that was a direct strike, no damage. But everything, everything in my house is all bonded and grounded, and so I don't have an issue. But the inside is also bonded and grounded, which Ward Silver is going to talk about. So I did not only have I done the outside, I've also done the inside. And all of this actually goes to help control RFI, which uh, Ward Silver is going to be uh, talking about. And how oh, I, I got stuck this in, I forgot about that. The, I've been asked about the ICOM 905, IC905. In my mind, the IC905 was designed for rovers. It wasn't designed to be a tower installed radio. Uh, if, you're going to, if you're going to mount it on a tower, treat it as you would a mass mounted preamp or a mesh Wi Fi device. And uh, you'll see in their instructions, you're supposed to, they talk about ground, grounding it. Um, I would mount the I would mount the the RF unit up on the mast close to the tower top. I would run a ground wire from the ground terminal of the RF unit to a clamp on the on the uh, the tower leg or mast. Um, and the general intent is to keep the antenna and the RF unit at the same voltage level as the tower at that point. Uh, depending upon the antenna, I would use a Nextech. Uh, uh, coax arrestor similar to the PTCONXONF20G. It's good to 20 gigahertz. Uh, I would also mount two Ethernet uh, protectors, one at the up at the unit and one down at the ground. And once again, I have uh, part numbers. Uh, and once again, follow his guidance in, in Ward Silver's uh, presentation for the control unit. Um, the references for this uh, lighting protection came from Polyphaser's book, came from War, uh, Ward Silver's uh, book, uh, and from a few pages on the next few pages. And there's there's a whole bunch of links on the next few pages. If you download the the PowerPoint, you'll have access to all of this. Um, so I'm just sort of bouncing through these, a whole bunch of different links. And I wanted to say also thanks to to Ward Silver for providing images for this uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Al Torres, KP4AQI, for his uh, additional information and review. And the reviewers were John uh, Monteith, WYXD, uh, Ward Silver, and AX, and uh, Dr. Al Torres, KP4AQI. And here's the QR image if you want to download it. Uh, I've also started to build on this miscellaneous page. I started to build a spreadsheet for coax losses. If uh, you're ever looking for information on coax losses, little by little it's being built up. Uh, but if you take a picture of, the, of this QR code, it should allow you to download my presentation. 